This week on the All American Legacy Podcast. When you wear the 80 Seconds AA patch in the Maroon Beret, you walk among the ghosts of legends. The great deeds their fathers had performed could be repeated by the sons. Therefore, I thought the name should be All American. All American is such a perfect name for the new unit. This is the 82nd Airborne Division, fearless among fighting units. From Fort Bragg, home of the Airborne and the center of the military universe, this is the All-American Legacy Podcast, an inside look at the 100-year history of the 82nd. They are All-American all the way. Welcome to the first episode of the All-American Legacy Podcast. I'm Staff Sergeant Will Rainier from the 82nd Airborne Division's Public Affairs Office. To kick things off, we decided the only appropriate place to start was the birth of the division. This year, we're celebrating 100 years of service to our nation, so today, we're going to go all the way back to 1917. Here's Master Sergeant Patrick Malone. The All-American Division. America's Guard of Honor. The 82nd Airborne Division is the most celebrated unit in American military history. When you wear the 82nd's AA patch in the Maroon Beret, you walk among the ghosts of legends. If you have never served in the 82nd, you probably know the names. Gavin, Magellus, York, and many others. You certainly know the places. Moose Argonne, Normandy, Sicily, Salerno. This podcast, the All-American Legacy Podcast, is about people and places you probably don't know. I'm Master Sergeant Patrick Malone, currently serving in the 82nd Airborne Division, and I have the honor of hosting our inaugural episode of this unique podcast. On August 5th of this year, we celebrate 100 years of active service of the 82nd Airborne Division. The idea behind this podcast is best captured by the words of General Matthew Ridgway. In 1942, General Ridgway reconstituted the 82nd for World War II. He wanted to recall the All-Americans' World War I legacy. These are the words from his memoirs. It was a proud division, but it was a name, a legend, a memory only, in February of 1942 when General Bradley and I reported at Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. It had been deactivated in 1918 and had gone out of existence. Now the German was on the march again and it was our job to recreate it from a cadre of professionals picked from the best units of the regular army. We had nothing on which to build except this fine nucleus of trained regulars and the bright legend of the old 82nd. To both General Bradley and me, it seemed vitally important to indoctrinate each new recruit with the proud spirit of the old division, to plant in each man's mind that valor endured from generation to generation, that the great deeds their fathers had performed could be repeated by the sons. That is the spirit of the All-American Legacy Podcast. Our paratroopers can and must perform their combat duties with the same heroism as their airborne forefathers. This podcast focuses on the personal stories from our 100-year history. There are many stories that have never been told, and voices that have never been heard from our shared legacy. Our goal is to personalize our history, to shed light on the lesser-known portions of the legend of the All-American Division and the people behind them. We will also disprove some of the myths from 82nd history and replace them with facts. Every week we will release another episode. Over the course of 14 episodes, we will cover all of the major events of the 100-year history of this division. You will hear stories of courage, heroism, and valor on the fields of battle. That is our legacy. That is the legacy of today's All-American Paratroopers. We carry the bloodline of a warrior class that saved the world from tyranny, defeated Nazism, deployed in support of democracy in Haiti, South Vietnam, and the Dominican Republic, and shed blood during multiple combat tours in a global war on terrorism. That kind of courage is in our DNA. We're all American and fight, we will boot and perish, kill all the guns of the four, I still ship, get ready, airborne from skies of blue, stand in the door, we're coming through, make your jumps and take your bumps today, let's go. So, we'll start at the very beginning. Our first episode today will focus on the formation of the 82nd Division, the mother of the 82nd, and the creation of the All-American Insignia. This is back before World War II. 
back before Fort Bragg, and back even before the 82nd was airborne. This story is the birth of the 82nd Infantry Division. The United States declared war on Germany on April 6, 1917, and entered into World War I. On August 25, 1917, just four months after the declaration of war, the Army created the 82nd Division. The 82nd acquired the name All-American, as the division was made up of men from all 48 states. So let us stop right here. The story goes that Major General Eben Swift, the first commander of the 82nd, along with his staff, came up with the name when they realized that there were men from all 48 states in the division. According to documents found by Mr. John Arson, director of the 82nd Airborne Division War Memorial Museum, this is an urban legend. The Atlanta Georgian has a contest, and so they put out to solicit nicknames for the 82nd Airborne Division. And over 5,000 names are submitted. And what's unique is in 1917, photography is not, there's not a huge amount of it, but the division's naming contest at least earns a couple of photo- photos in the coverage of the newspaper. There's a photo of a young lady holding all the names in a trash can at that time, an open wicker trash can, and it's overflowing with names. General Swift and his staff selected the name All-American, submitted by Vivian Goodwin. And Vivian Goodwin was a volunteer at a uh, morale and welfare type organization, a club where soldiers would go. And she had actually suggested that name to a soldier to be submitted, but the soldier didn't seem to be enthused about it. Vivian explained the meaning behind the name during an interview with the Atlanta Georgian. The 82nd was made up of such a mixture of the ingredients for the melting pot out of which has come the people known as American. Therefore, I thought the name should be All-American. All-American is such a perfect name for the new unit. Vivian Goodwin is, in many ways, the mother of this division. The division leadership chose All-American, and in reviewing some of the hundreds of names submitted, it's a good thing they did. Some of the names were just awful. For example, names submitted include Bluebird, United States Buddies, and Mother's Pet. Now, Mother's Pet does not exactly strike fear in the hearts of our nation's enemies. And can you imagine serving in a division called Mascot or the Singing Division? The Singing Division does not really sound like an organization that is ready to jump into battle and kill our enemies. Some of the proposed names made sense back then, but wouldn't have held up over time. For example, the Circular Saw Division was a reference to a saying at the turn of the century that a fighter, a real tough guy, would fight against a circular saw. Then there were names that were specific to our World War I enemy. Kaiser and Hun were derogatory names for Germans. There were names proposed such as Hun Haters, Kaiser Crackers, and Kaiser Catchers. Catchers intentionally spelled with a K. So now that we've uncovered the real meaning behind the name All American, let's take a look at the real meaning behind our insignia. Everyone all around the world recognizes our famous double A patch the white letters, the blue circle inside the red square, the word airborne scrolled over the top. Back at the start of World War I, many people who had not heard of the division assumed the AA on the patch meant all aboard. We, of course, know it to mean all American. Here again, Mr. Arson explains. Well, the red and the blue, of course, for the two things, when you look at it, you'll see those are the colors of the infantry and the field artillery, but also When you combine that with red, white, and blue, those are the national colors. And so most of these patches were made in little tiny French villages. And so what will happen, the collectors now can look at a division patch and know exactly where it was sewn. Because a unit would go commission them from the same seamstress. They would all look alike from that unit, and they would all be nearly identical. And what was unique, too, is when the patch was first authorized, you'll see gold ones and white ones because the gold was for the officers and the white was for the enlisted but later they standardized the division with the red white and blue that you see now it turns out that our insignia was not created until after world war one the 82nd did not have an insignia until november of 1917 the division's insignia comes back from its world war one time period 
And what you have to, when you look at the division patch, again, it comes from the logistics marks that were painted on the division's equipment when they shipped from the continental United States to France, and then combined with the division's nickname of All Americans. And so they take those two elements and create the division's insignia. Now, the insignias are created at the end of the war, so the fighting's all over, and they're creating them at, at the end as they're kind of uh, recouping and rebuilding and retraining because, it, of course, the Germans aren't defeated on the battlefield. There's an armistice, so, the, of course, the army's real scared that they might come back and start a fight again. So all the units are training, and that's during this period is when the divisions and is created. So with this first episode, we are just introducing the origin behind the great legacy, the patch, and the name. Starting next week, you'll hear voices from the distant past and voices from today's 82nd Airborne Division. You'll hear stories about the division's fierce fighting in Afghanistan, search and rescue in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, the heroism of the Golden Brigade during the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, and of course, our World War II airborne operations. Please download next week's episode, First Contact, a look at our division's combat history in World War I. The All-American Legacy Podcast is produced by the 82nd Airborne Division Public Affairs Office, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Bacino, Major Rob Lodwick, Sergeant First Class Alex Burnett, Staff Sergeant Will Rainier, and me, Master Sergeant Patrick Malone. Special thanks to Major Lonnie Ayers, John Arson, George Richards, and Dr. Peter Murray. Special thanks to Master Sergeant Patrick Malone, who put that together. I'm Staff Sergeant Will Rainier once again, and now joined by Lieutenant Colonel Joe Bacino, who is not only the co-host of this podcast, but also the 82nd Airborne Division historian. So, sir, welcome to the show. Thanks. Very excited. The inaugural episode and the 100th year. Absolutely. And we've got the first episode out now. And so what was your big takeaway from episode one, Birth? I think the perhaps most controversial part of this uh, for people listening now is going to be the idea that uh, we've just debunked, although many other people have have debunked it, that the name All-American came from uh, the the commander and came from the idea that the division was represented by all 48 states. And so we heard that quote from Vivian Goodwin, who really what she was getting at uh, when she submitted that name was that there were a, a list of qualities if you will, uh, things like bravery and pride and tradition that that all Americans had at the time. You think about the context of 1917. Uh, this is before the Great Depression. Westward expansion is is moving out, and, and there really is a, a great source of pride for all Americans. And so taking those qualities uh, and listing them out like that, she what she's really saying is that these are things that, that all Americans have. And so that makes such a, a perfect fit for a unit uh, that, that is going off to fight in World War I. Yeah, and she was writing in the idiom of the day in the American South, so it's open a little bit to interpretation 100 years later. I think you're right. You know, one of the things that's in the division's official history that is very unique and very particular to the 82nd is that at the time, in 1917, before they sailed off to France, the division, uh, about 20% of the division was comprised of immigrants. And so that was a really new thing. You know, the, the idea of forming a unit with people outside of your immediate area, that was a very new thing. So, and it was also unique to the division, if you look at uh, to the 82nd Division, if you look at the other divisions formed to fight in World War One. Right. You would get a lot of, uh, you know, the Massachusetts Regiment or the uh, very localized uh, regiments of, of fighters. And really, this was one of the first units that would pull in fighters from different areas, uh, pull in soldiers from different areas. And so the kind of romanticized notion that we have soldiers from all 48 states is really kind of what made that legend stick and something that people even today uh, believe. Yeah, I mean, look, it's in our uh, division pamphlet. It's talked about uh, in the official movie, in the official history as you enter the division. Um, You know, and it's a great uh, story. It's certainly a compelling story, easy to remember. Um, But, uh, you know, the truth is is obvious. It's always a little uh, more complicated. 
then let's take this opportunity and uncomplicate it. What what is the the ground truth to the name the All American Division? We can only go by what we know and but why by what has been recorded and most of what has been recorded was recorded uh, by the division, by the division's chief of staff and the division's commanders. So we know Eben Swift set this contest in motion and we believe that General William P. Burnham, the third commander, selected the name All-Americans. According to the formal records of the division, the name was selected on April 6th, 1918. At that point, Burnham was the commanding general, and it was issued through a general order issued by the division's chief of staff. The formal order reads, The 82nd Division represents the best manhood from every state in the Union. In view of this fact, the commanding general designates this division and orders that it be known as the All-American Division. Now, it, it should be clarified here that there is no evidence, there is no documentation that Vivian Goodwin was aware that the division was comprised of soldiers from all, all 48 states. She seemed to be referring more to the attributes and the qualities that you mentioned. So essentially what, what we're seeing here is that by April of 1918, it was clear that, that the 82nd did have soldiers from every state in the Union, but that wasn't necessarily the genesis of the name when Vivian Goodwin wrote it up, but it just kind of worked out that way. Right. Great. So moving on, what else was it about this episode that really stood out to you? You know, a lot of people believe that Burnham made the division a singing division, that he focused the division on choral singing and uh, marching in formation and esprit de corps, team building, and that is also not true. Those are those were the ideas of Eben Swift, and a lot of historians and a lot of books get that wrong. You know, Douglas Mastriano, we like him, phenomenal historian. He's on here in a later episode. But his book, Alvin York, uh, gets this wrong as well. Uh, Eben Swift was the commander who made the division the singing di- division. Now, why do you think it is that, that, that that's kind of been misremembered throughout history? Well, you know, Eben Swift didn't command the division for very long. Um, and Burnham was always in the 82nd. Uh, Burnham commanded the 164th Brigade in the division at its formation. So he was always there on Camp Gordon, uh, but he was a brigade commander first. So, and then he also, he took command in December 1917. So Swift only commanded the division for about 90 days. Between the end of August and the end of November of 1917, there was a second commander, Brigadier General James Irwin, who was there for about three weeks. And then Burnham came on at the end of December for quite a while, almost a year. Uh, and Burnham was promoted from Brigadier General to Major General while in command. And one uh, little footnote of history here is that uh, General Blackjack Pershing, the American Expeditionary Forces commander, the commander of all U.S. forces in World War I, uh, fired Burnham and uh, replaced him with Major General George Duncan uh, after shortly after the St. Mihiel Offensive. So that was kind of um, unprecedented at the time. Uh, why, why did he come in and, and make that change? Why fire Burnham? There's no real detailed understanding of this other than that General Pershing felt he was not aggressive enough, presumably not aggressive enough offensively, and not forceful enough with his subordinates. But, uh, you know, he did perform well. The division did perform well in St. Mihiel. Uh, nonetheless, um, Blackjack Pershing made the change. History is kind of hard on, on uh, General Eben Swift. Uh, why is that? Well, a lot of the a lot of the ideas and a lot of the initiatives and a lot of the things he did in the division were pretty useless in combat. You know, singing in, in formation, singing in units, um, marching around, esprit de corps building. You know, these things were pretty useless in combat. You know, if you look at the 1st Infantry Division and you look at their history, for example, before they moved to Europe, they focused on movement, uh, operating in formation. They did a battalion trench warfare exercise, a series of battalion trench warfare exercises. Um, and we, you know, the division here, Evan Swift was focused on things that, uh, that didn't have much combat utility. And then uh, a lot of people feel like we paid for that, uh, the division paid for that, particularly in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. So I want to go back to well, Evan Swift. One, one other thing. Okay, we should explain. 
Um, you know, one other thing about uh, Swift that should be should be explained here is that is just the context of of what was happening when he formed the division. You know, if you think about uh, what history refers to as Wilsonian isolationism, uh, you know, before the U.S. entered World War One, President Wilson opposed any action here in the United States that might be construed as Americans preparing for war or putting Americans on a war footing. So American units didn't do very much combat-specific training. So so th- these were these were basically raw recruits. You know, a lot of these were conscripted soldiers. These men had been blacksmiths, farmers, factory workers. Many of them knew how to fire a weapon, um, but they didn't know patrolling or movement. They didn't really know what they would be facing in Europe. And so there were some missed opportunities there for Swift to to uh, do some basic uh, level tr- basic levels of training to get the, to get the unit prepared. Very different than the type of training that we see in today's military, but. You know, General Swift was still the first commander of the division, so there has to be some redeeming quality there, uh, kind of to the defense of General Swift. Um, what is it that history tells us? Well, you know, I don't know that there is some sort of uh, great defense, some sort of opposing view. I mean, he certainly wanted the he wanted to build unit cohesion. We can all understand that, and he felt that uh, you know pride, pride in the unit. That's uh, obviously always important. We see it today. Uh, that's what his focus was. Um, you know, I think a lot of people look at that and, and look at the time and look at some of the other commanders and the other divisions and said, well, you could have built pride and built the esprit de corps while you were building combat readiness. And we'll see that training and readiness on full display in our next episode, First Contact. So here's a little preview of that. It's available now on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. So we'll leave you with a preview of our next episode, and we'll see you then, episode two, First Contact, here on the All-American Legacy Podcast. You know, when we think about our bloodline and our great legacy, there is so much focus on World War II, and perhaps not enough focus on World War I. The Allies will gain new heart and spirit in your company. I wish that I could shake the hand of each one of you and bid you Godspeed on your mission. So the war was on, the U.S. was in, and the brand new 82nd was committed. Now they had to get to the fight.